Okay, and now time for our final speaker and um, uh, time for a change of scale. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Brad Nelson to the stage from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, where he's Professor of Robotics and Intelligent Systems. His primary focus is on micro-robotics and nano-robotics, particularly in bio biology and medicine. Uh, Brad uh, forged his academic career in the USA and secured his PhD in robotics at Carnegie Mellon University. He's had an industrial career with Honeywell and Motorola and also interestingly served as a United States Peace Corps volunteer in Botswana. He serves on a number of editorial boards, as you would expect from somebody of his caliber, and is a member of the Research Council of the Swiss National Science Foundation. Welcome, Brad. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's, uh a tough crowd to follow, let me tell you. Some wonderful talks. I've, I've learned a lot. It's, it's always, it's seldom I get to spend all day just listening to, to smart people tell me what's going on and what's at the forefront of the field. I want to talk today about uh, things we've been doing. I've been in Zurich for 13 years. We've been doing for the last uh, 10 years, uh, t 12 years or so, uh, on, on small scale robotics. Uh, and I, I uh, made a statement yesterday I'm just an engineer, and what I mean by that is I just like to build things that move. Uh, I like to build small things and uh, try to uh, understand, uh, how, as we change scales, how does, how does that vary? And, and one of the applications we found as we've worked in this field of micro nanorobotics is that medicine uh, seems like something that we can uh, uh, apply some of these to. And so I've become interested in, in the field of medical robotics, and we've heard about the da Vinci system. And so um, in surfing the internet, uh, thinking I knew any, everything about the field, I was surprised to come across this product sheet. Uh, for the, uh, the MedPod tw uh, 720i, uh, and it's a, a surgical system. The, the patient uh, uh, is, is put in here, and there's uh, laser scalpels and, uh, uh, let's see, also a liquid spray anesthetic. And, and, you know, and I found this on the Internet and then um, realized, uh, after a little bit, uh, being surprised that it actually is, is an actor in a movie. Uh, it's a science fiction movie called Prometheus, if you've seen it. And, and, and I think this is the direction... We have the, 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 the discussion earlier today about you know, whether we want full autonomy or shared autonomy. This is a fully autonomous surgeon because uh, one of the, the actors in the movie got impregnated by an alien as this uh, uh, spaceship was flying to some distant star system, and she had to have an emergency uh, C-section. She just pushed the button in, and I'll blur that so you don't have to look at it. <laughs> uh, but she just pushed the button in, crawled in, and the system did, surgery, did the whole procedure. No, no human involved. I think that's science fiction. I deal with science fiction a lot in, this, in my research. So I came across this advertisement as well on the internet, which I think is, is fascinating. It shows a, a surgeon here with a uh, robot arm, and it says, uh, one part surgeon, one part machine, both parts amazing. <laughs> and it's, a real, it's, it's from a, a hospital in, in Miami, <clears throat> and they're trying to advertise how high tech they are, right? This is a good thing. My, uh, uh, Da Vinci systems, the public accepts these. They, they, they think technology is good. Uh, they, they trust these. My mother and my sister-in-law just got operated on by Da Vinci's recently. Uh, and and uh, it, it's a technology that's been around now for over a decade and has certainly proven itself profitable. Uh, uh, and, and there's a, a, certainly a lot of companies coming on. And, and there are great groups here in, in the UK, particularly uh, Guangzhou Yang and uh, at Imperial and, and a number of other groups in the UK that are, that are in this field. And we're just going to see it continuing to grow. But science fiction, uh, you know, presented as science fiction, but, it, but it's real in, in a certain sense here. So, so here's some, some other science fiction I want to go back to that kind of motivates what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, if we can have the sound. a submarine yeah. with crew and surgical team, injecting <laughs> it into the carotid artery. <clears throat> Stand by. Stand by for injection. Right. Inject. There's a blood clot, and he has all these nuclear secret or nuclear knowledge, and so they need to save him, and so they inject their the, the army injects their secret weapon in him to to, to to get rid of the blood clot. You know it's. Science fiction, because now I mean, uh, saving a scientist, with, with that, is that where you'd put your resources, <laughs> I think? But uh, um, 
But you know, Hollywood gives us a lot of imagination, but of course Hollywood has some, some real advantages over, over the kind of things we do. And I have to battle with those, especially with, with journalists sometimes and people that want to make bigger stories than what we're capable of. And, and the first is uh, they don't have to worry about physics. Uh, they don't really have to worry about uh, F equals MA, about uh, uh, surface forces, uh, about a lot of these uh, <clears throat> kind of things. The other things they, they don't have to worry about is how do you actually make these things, right? They can fake it. But there's another thing that's important to this as you're doing research, especially as an engineer, is that you've got to also think about viable business plans. I mean, does it even make sense to put the kind of resources that are required to go into this area? Is there potential at the end of the tunnel? Uh, we don't know. Of course, we can't always an answer that when we go on, but we've got to also think about how, what are the steps this is going to take. And so, uh, one of the first things we, we, when we started thinking about small robots and, sm and very small devices was, how are you going to make these things move? What is going to be the, you know, we don't have this uh, shrink ray, right, uh, uh, unfortunately. Um, but but the, the community, as it's been working on this over the past decade or so, has kind of settled on the idea of using magnetic forces. Because, you know, we're, we're, bodies are we're pretty safe in magnetic fields. It's, you know, we're, we all, a lot of us have been in MRIs, and we, we understand magnetic fields are pretty biocompatible. So there's just a little bit of physics I want to <clears throat> show you here, because this governs a lot of uh, the... Uh, constraints on what we have, and that is uh, how we generate forces and torques, and it's pretty simple. Uh, forces are, are generated by the volume of a material, this magnetic material, the M stands for magnetization, so it has to be something that's magnetic, like iron or nickel or neodymium iron boron, a, a rare earth. Um, and if we put that in a gradient, uh, uh, this represents a magnetic field, if we put that in a, a field that's getting stronger, it will be attracted in the direction that the field's getting stronger. That's, that's one of the first part. The second is torque. Torque is pretty simple. It's like a, a compass needle on a, you know, that, that aligns with the field. So you can just, as you move the field, you can get things to align. So that's some of the, the basic governing equations. And that um, means a lot in how we design things and puts a lot of constraints on us. One of the things we did in our group was, well, first of all, we tried to move things in a plane. Uh, and then I uh, brought in a, uh, a postdoc named Jake Abbott, who's at Utah now. And I said, OK, make, take the 2D and make it 3D. And he was able to. Uh, the result of, of his work with, with one of my PhD students, Michael Comer, was, was this system we called an octomag. And what it is, it's eight electromagnets. So here's four, and then there's four underneath. And each one of those electromagnets we control the current in. And that makes a stronger or a weaker field, or even reverses the field, depending on how much electricity we put into it. What Jake and uh, Michael were able to do was look at how we can cast this within the frame of robotics. We can treat, think of each of these as like the joint of a robot arm. And if we put it in that framework, all of a sudden I've got 50 years of robotics kinematic research that I can bring to bear on this problem and tells us how to deal with this. Now you might ask why eight? The reason we went did eight was we did numerical simulations and we discovered somehow uh, eight seemed like the right number. Now if I want to move an object with five degrees of freedom or six degrees of freedom, I have you know, x, y, z, and I can point and maybe even rotate, you'd think I need as many actuators as degrees of freedom. That would be your intuition. We just proved mathematically this year it turns out that if you want to move with five degrees of freedom, then that, that is two pointing uh, angles. You're not rotating here. But eight is, a min uh, is the minimum number you need mathematically. We never realized that. Nobody realized that until just this year. It seems like something you could, uh, uh, should have been known, but it wasn't. Uh, but one of the things that allowed us to do by casting this problem within this framework was very precisely control the position and orientation within a 3D space. This looks relatively simple. This thing's about a, a millimeter or two long made out of nickel. And it's put within those eight electromagnets and we're very, very precisely controlling the feed fields and, and how those fields are getting stronger or weaker. And this is uh, an idea. These are the, the currents. And, and this is uh, a key to a lot of what I'm going to show in the next few slides because <clears throat> nobody had been able to do this before. And so this is something that we patented at ETH and allows us to very precisely control small things within 3D volumes. That's a new idea. <coughs> so we were thinking of what to do with it. Uh, what, what, where are some areas of the body we can work in? One of the first things we thought about was retinal surgery, going into the, the eye. One of the nice things is you can look in the eye and see it. I don't have to worry about MRIs or CTs or any of that. I can use an ophthalmic microscope. There's no flow in the eye, so things kind of stay where they are. Uh, and so we, we developed this system, and this is a, from a, a video the Discovery Channel made for us. This is kind of the concept of injecting one of these devices into your ocular cavity and then having this octomag sequence of coils over you, guiding it, uh, to the retina. This is actually in a, a, an enucleated pig's eye. This guy's about a half a millimeter, about 500 microns in diameter, about a millimeter long or so. And we can move them throughout the 3D space of the eye. And so that was one of the results of that. That was, uh, and, and here, uh, 
oops, is the, uh, this is one of our, our systems now, more, uh, more well-engineered, it looks a lot nicer, and it's portable, we take it to the animal hospital, and so we can uh, do, do animal, rabbit experiments. One of our design criteria for this, we call it a micro-robot, but it's just really an engineered piece of magnet, in this case, uh, uh, it's uh, got a little, uh, hyper, a little needle on it. It's about a third of a millimeter, so it's very, very tiny. You can see it on the finger here. Uh, and we modeled it after uh, uh, what, what are called intervitreal inserts. These are, are, are uh, basically little chambers that can, can, you can put into, that are sometimes put in the eye to diffuse drugs uh, over a period of time. And so um, what we, what we uh, were able to show with it uh, was that we can uh, generate enough force to puncture retinal veins. This vein is about the width of a hair, to give you an idea. This is in a, a, a rabbit eye injection, one of the first experiments we did, and actually moving it within the intact vitreous of a rabbit eye over the, uh, the rabbit's, uh, uh, within the ocular cavity. So, so we've gone, to, you know, taking this idea from, from uh, you know, very robotics uh, roots all the way through to, uh, to some animal trials to, to try to investigate it. And we're continuing on this direction and, and, and working with ophthalmic surgeons and even spun off a company to, to, to do some of these kinds of uh, activities. We're also thinking about what other places might we do this? What other parts of the body might you look at? And, and so one of the things was the heart. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to uh, inject micro-robots and let them swim around inside of my heart. Doctors aren't going aren't to let you do that. But one thing they, they, they might let you do is if we could take some of our control algorithms to control these small things and apply it at the end of a catheter, so something that's tipped, and use the tip of that catheter, think of that as our micro-robot, then we'd be able to move these catheters in ways we couldn't before. So we built this system in my lab. Uh, it's like the Octomag I showed you before, only it's big enough for a, a small person to lie in. We put up to 70 kilogram pigs in it. Um, this is all x-ray protection because we use fluoroscopy to look into there. And this is one of the fluoroscope images. And so one of the really big wins here from this system is we can get radiuses of curvature on these catheters that you simply can't get any other way. There's no, there's no, a lot of catheters are guided by wires down the middle. They're very stiff and they've got limited radiuses. These can be very, very floppy, which makes them safe, but we can very precisely control the forces and torques on the tip and get these huge ranges of motion. So what might you use that for? Where could the application be? And so we spun off a, a company that considers, considered business plans, and what they've arrived at is doing uh, a treatment called catheter ablation for people who have cardiac arrhythmia is one of these diseases that are happening as, as people tend to get older, where parts of the heart are, are beating improperly. The uh, electrophysiologists will figure out if they put a, a catheter into your femoral artery, they can bring it up into your, this is the left atrium and, and the, the, the right atrium, and, and treat a, a number of different arrhythmias in the heart by just ablating tissue to stop those electrical signals from progressing through there. Um, and, and one of the challenges for these electrophysiologists is moving the tip of that catheter and getting it very precisely located. And then basically what they're doing is cooking the tissue. They're just heating the tissue and, and not allowing the electrical signals to pass in these directions to get the heart to, to, to uh, reduce those arrhythmias. So that also, uh, that, that company then, uh, remember that first schlocky uh, Octomag I showed you, the first prototype, has become something uh, that looks like this. Here's the patient, joystick controlled. Uh, um, <coughs> sort of a graphic of what the inner chambers of the heart might look like. It's uh, not that, and, and uh, then here are the, the fields. And so um, this is a system that was actually been built as in, in, in a clinic about uh, 15 kilometers from my lab, just on the outside of Zurich. In Vetsicon, uh, you see it's, it's got uh, the electromagnetic coils here. There's actually, we only, for this particular uh, one, there's seven, and I can explain that mathematically, but there's three here, four there. There's a, 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 a fluoroscope and then the patient is in here, and so from this first idea of how to make small robots move, we've gone all the way to a system in a clinic, and in fact, we've also done, um, we're, we've also done patients. So our first human, we got our CE mark uh, this August and immediately started doing patients, and August 21st was the first one. This is an electrophysiologist who work with Firat Duru. This is a local electrophysiologist. He's training to use the system, and you'll see what's, the patients in this room, we're all behind the, uh, the x-ray protection here from the fluoroscope. And they are looking at, this is a, a map of the inner chambers of the heart. It's a graphic of the inner chambers of the heart. Again, here's the, the patient all by uh, himself or herself. Uh, everybody else is in another room controlling it. Uh, and they're precisely controlling this catheter. And this is the, the, the tip of the catheter. He's controlling it with a joystick. He's monitoring it with a fluoroscope. Notice the huge, uh, uh, huge bend of the fluoroscope here. So that it's getting that high curvature. And really looking here. and, and identifying places in the heart where he's, he's done two runs. Here's the red is one run and the green's another where he's just touched a part of the heart and fried it. 
And this is one of the joys of my engineering career has been building, taking this, sitting there and watching this device and knowing there's, a, there's patients uh, uh, awake. One of our, uh, the devices that came out of my lab is in her heart and is literally, uh, you know, doing heart surgery in, in a sense. Uh, uh, and that, uh, you know, and, and the system worked. We turned it on, you know, I mean, as an engineer, you just, uh, you watch this and it's, 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 a, it's a joy. Now, <clears throat> we're continuing uh, in a lot of different areas in this field. Um, but one of the things, I, you know, we, we've really tried to push in one of the more fundamental areas is trying to go smaller, trying to think about things that can go in small veins, capillaries, uh, uh, trying to make robots the size of blood, small blood cells. So I talked about the importance of physics. Well, if you look at scaling laws as we go smaller, a lot of those, those, those physical laws I showed you about forces don't scale well. So we need other solutions. And so as engineers, when you, you're not sure how to solve a problem, uh, it's always good to let, look at nature and try to understand, you know, how, how do, for instance, microorganisms swim? What, what, is the, uh, what is the physics behind that? What's the mathematics behind that? <clears throat> so here are paramecia. Uh, this, this guy is about uh, 100, 150 microns in size, and he has a, a lot of these uh, uh, fl uh, small cilia on him, hundreds of them that are swimming in unison. This is a spermatozoa that has a single a flagella that's moving in a very particular traveling wave. And so we know a lot about the mathematics and physics. We've just learned these over the last few decades. Why are they moving this way? But there's a lot of you know, very interesting fundamental research uh, in this area um, and a lot of great work going on. Here in the UK, we work with, with several people at Cambridge and, and Oxford as well in, in some of these. Um, <clears throat> but one of the uh, organisms that, that was most interesting to us is bacteria like E. coli. Um, in, in 1973, Howard Berg, when he was at uh, Colorado uh, was, was studying E. coli. They're a swimming uh, microorganism. And people weren't sure how they swam. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, when they would look at them under a microscope, they would see the, uh, the tail. Uh, and they couldn't tell what it was doing until Howard realized it was rotating. Um, and, and one interesting story I usually tell was it was in uh, uh, se the 1700s, when it was 17. Uh, I want to say 1776, but that's not. That's the U.S. Independence Day. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, the, first per the first person to see bacteria swim was Anton von Leeuwenhoek in, uh, in the Netherlands with one of the first microscopes. Uh, and he wrote a letter to the Royal Society uh, and, uh, about this. And, and so people started looking at, you know, getting pond water and stuff, looking under it, and were surprised to find microorganisms swimming. Uh, and verified this a year after he sent the letter. So, so the first reported microorganisms was, was, was reported to the, the Royal Society uh, over three, well over 300 years ago. Anyway, we were looking at these, and, and you, know, I, you look at nature and you think, man, the rotary motor is amazing. Uh, people think that's evidence of, that God does exist and is a design, uh, an engineering designer. Literally, people believe that. Um, but they have these amazing 45 nanometer motors made out of about 35, 40 different uh, proteins. They've got 40 different kinds of proteins. Uh, this is, these are real bacteria swimming. This is, again, from Howard's lab. Now, I don't have the nanotechnology available to me to make this uh, particular uh, motor. But what I do have available, what we had been working on just for, for fun, sort of, was were, were nano ribbons. Uh, these are, are rib, this ribbon is about 20 nanometers thick, or thin, I should say, made out of this one's made out of a, a layer of gallium arsenide. We, we, bla we imp uh, implant. Uh, Indian ions into it, and then we put another layer, layer of gallium arsenide, we get stress relief, and if we get all of our crystalline planes set up, we can get these things to roll up into this really nice shape, which is almost the exact same size as a bacterial flagella. Uh, and then what we did was we put a little piece of nickel on the head, and so to give you an idea of the length, this one is one of our big ones, and he's probably about 50 microns long, maybe twice or half of the width of a hair or so. Uh, and, and this head is uh, some, some microns in size. And what we discovered is if we put this in, in fluid and we put it in a rotating magnetic field, and these are very weak fields, these fields are about a millitesla, so about a thousand times less than an MRI. As they rotate, they propel themselves forward, similar to how E. coli swim. It was discovered over 300 years ago, not, just not reported in the literature, uh, the mechanism until 1973, and we still aren't sure exactly how that motor works, but we've got a pretty good idea. So we made these devices, and to give you an idea of some of the scale, this is a micrograph of a human hair. These are some of the smallest ones we've made, and that's the size of a red blood cell. So we are getting devices that are getting to be the size of red blood cells, and we can get them to swim. And so this is a, a video that we made 
quite some time ago. We got three of them together. You see the head swimming and moving. And uh, the fluid dynamics is, is, is wonderful. There's a, a lot of really interesting work on, on uh, the type of uh, low Reynolds number conditions that this operates in. And, and what we did here was it was swimming forward. We just reversed the field, and they start going exactly backwards. So you can see how your intuition is failing you as, uh, in terms of fluids if you're just thinking of, of, of how you swim. Now, we were very pleased to, to discover that we uh, uh, we found ourselves in the Guinness Book of World Records for the smallest uh, uh, medical microrobot. This is one of our first ones with 60 microns in length. They saw that. We've made them smaller than that, though. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's great to be in the Guinness Book of World Records, but I think something that would be even more rewarding would be uh, if we could uh, earn a medal in the Olympics. And so what we think we're going to do is we're going to become, uh, we're, we're in synchronized swimming. Uh, there's three of them right here. <coughs> anyway, uh, a little shameless advertising for my university. So, um, so one of the things we're, we're, we're continuing along this line is, though, is to take these devices and figure out, okay, well, we can make them swim, and that's fun. And that's just, just uh, uh, the, the way it brings together the physics, the fluid dynamics, magnetism, uh, fabrication procedures, and all this, you know, the bioinspiration is really intellectually interesting. But we want to figure out, uh, you know, what can we do with them? So we work a lot on how to functionalize them, how to attach different kinds of molecules, how to use them, for instance, to deliver drugs to individual cells, uh, and how to make them in, in better and more biocompatible, non-cytotoxic ways. Uh, and so along the route, I started off with indium gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide. We've come up with ways of making them out of polymers and, and, and making biocompatible ones. We've, we've, we've loaded them with uh, DNA, in this case, a, a yellow fluorescent protein called a venous protein. And we have uh, had it touch, uh, these are kidney cells. This is in vitro in, in, uh, in a petri dish. And this is from the image. These are the, the helices of the swimmer. And this is one of the uh, uh, transfected cells. And, and I've demonstrated we can do gene, gene transfection on individual cells with them. We've also taken a, uh, uh, 80,000 of them. Uh, so we've taken a swarm of them uh, and tagged them with a near-infrared dye and then injected them. This is a mouse, a living mouse. And you can actually get the, the dye will transmit uh, uh, some, some, uh, some of the signal will transmit through the skin and look at it with an IR camera. And so this is a mouse where we've been able to, to put, like I said, 80,000 of these uh, and actually get them to swim around in the mouse. And so here's the cloud moving in a direction. This is uh, just put in a glass because we can't really see them that, that well. Uh, and these will move microns. Uh, Microns per second, I think, is, is some of the, and, and demonstrate the ability to, to move things around. So we're functionalizing them. We're, we're able to, to controllably move them. We're trying to knock off all these little uh, capabilities. Now, it's a long way before we're going to get as far as the, uh, the Aon scientific catheter ablation system. But we, you know, it, each, each time we, we move, we try to get a little bit further along the path and try to see uh, uh, what, what we can do with this. Uh, now, one of the things I, I, I mentioned was that we found better ways of making these one of the things that came out, uh, came onto the market as we were uh, doing, this, began this research, one of the things that came on the market was 3D nanoprinting. It's a two-photon photopolymerization process. It's a company out of Germany uh, that sells the system. And when we got a hold of that tool, we realized we could do things at a micro scale that nobody could do uh, in any other way. And so one of the things we did was we put little end, eff end effectors at the end of that thing. There was no way before the nanoscribe that we could create this kind of a structure, but we can draw these and, and look at the scale sizes here. And so we can go around and, and trap parts and move them around. But this has opened up a whole new design space for us. And so now, <clears throat> I don't think any of this is published. Uh, maybe this one, I think, is just coming out now. But these are some of the structures we've been able to make. We, we, we magnetize part of them. We can get them to react to these magnetic fields. Uh, and it's fun. I mean, if you've ever worked in 3D printing, you know the joy, that the, the, the fun with that. But at the nanoscale, it gives us the ability to do things we couldn't do before. Um, that we've taken that Octomag and we've made it a, you know, a desktop thing under a microscope uh, and, and made some, and look at this guy, he's about 20 microns. So put five of these together and they'd be about the width of a hair. They have a little auger. They can pull particles in. We can release them when we want and we can guide them. So there's just a tremendous amount I think that's on the horizon here in terms of these, com what we call them compound micromachines that have uh, movable layers. They're not just helices that twist now, but things that actually can move against each other. So uh, that's what I wanted to say. I want to uh, leave you with a, 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 some, some big points that I, I hope you, you took away from here. I think uh, you know, the application area for this field we're seeing is medicine and biology is where we've done a lot of it. But we're also looking at things in manufacturing and even started some work in how we might do, uh, do environmental monitoring or even, even water remediation. 
with some of these devices and, and try to, 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 to treat uh, uh, polluted water. Um, I think over the last decade or, or, or so, we've seen tremendous strides in, in the nanorobotics community. And, and how do you power these things? How do you make them move? How do you make them? Um, and also, uh, looking at appropriate therapies. We, we can talk to doctors, and there's a lot of ideas, uh, a, a lot of concepts. They take a while to get there. But people, you know, there's, there's a, some enthusiasm from the medical community as well on what these kinds of things can do. We think it's a, you know, a, a lot of potential, but again, an uncertain timeline, because uh, it's not just a science, scientific and technological hurdle here. We, first of all, have to convince doctors there's something interesting to do if we're going to go into medicine. And of course, the investment is, is beyond even you know, a well-funded lab to, to get these into the clinic. That's why we have to spin off these companies and bring in external investors to try to go through the, the costs of, of, of circumventing all the medical device directives and getting the CE mark and these kinds of things. But I think it's a field that's in its infancy. It's got a long way to go. It's going to change a, a, a lot in the next 10 years and, and continue on. And I'm quite excited about it. So, um, and I, I have a, a great group back in Zurich and uh, uh, a very interdisciplinary group that brings together a lot of people, which has given us the chance to kind of look at this problem from a, from a lot of different angles. So thank you very much. Well, Brad, that was absolutely terrific. Um, I'd like to take some questions. On the floor. Anybody going to fire off? Okay. Now here at the front, just wait for the mic if you would, please. Thanks. Thank you. So, Brad, you can move these things around. How do you know where they are? <clears throat> okay. Good question. How do you know where they are? So, with the, uh, you know, in the mouse, we could we can observe them visually, right? Um, for, for the uh, uh, smaller things, we can look, we use fluoroscopy. We can look through with, with X-rays. Um, we haven't we haven't done this in MRI. Um, ideally, I don't I don't want to have to know where they are. What I want them to do is I want them to have their own behavior. I want to get them close to an area. I want them to look for a, a, a gradient, maybe maximize, I mean, head towards maybe increasing acidity or a, a slightly incre slight increase in temperature, or or shine an IR light, which can you know go through, penetrate tissue fairly far and have them all congregate there and, and have them do uh, get there on their own. But in terms of the catheter, when we did the mapping, that there's a whole uh, there's a, a whole industry behind how you you can do this using uh, different trackers in the body. So. Thank you. Okay. On here. Thanks, Brad. It's great to see the the catheter being used in practice. You know, and you got the CE marking and, and, and everything. Is there anything you can tell us about the journey about taking that to the situation where it could be used in, in clinical trials? Like, how long did it take? Yeah. And what did the certificate? Because that's a, you know, it's it's a challenge getting this kind of technology certified in a medical environment, and you've clearly had success and yeah, experience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it was surprisingly fast. Um, we uh, that first demonstration where we first demonstrated that our our our, 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 our technique of moving small things. Uh, that, that schlocky video of the coil thing. That was in September 2009. We spun a company off in 2010. We got the CE mark in 2015, so it was about five years. Now, one of the reasons we could do that so quickly was because we could piggyback on, on other, uh, 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 other devices. So we did not have to do human clinical trials before we sold it, but we just had to prove that it was safe because we could use it. Uh, uh, we, we could piggyback, basically, on, on other, other products that were similar in the market. So. So, so the interesting point there is that five years or six years was fast, right? It was, yeah, it, yeah I mean, every, yeah, I think anybody who's in the field and they think, you know, how did that, how did that happen so quickly? Uh, you know, there's, there's a strategy to it. And, and one of the things we'd love to do is go in, and we are doing, going in and designing new kinds of catheters. But we chose not to, to bring that for our first product because if we, if we try to design new catheters, we want to go for FDA approval, then we have to, we have to go through, uh, it's, it's considered a class three device and we have to do human clinical trials. It'll, it'll take a lot of money. And ch said we tr chose to use things on the market for part, those parts and then, and then add our system to it. So it's, you've got to have a strategy to it. And then once you kind of build credibility, well, then you get the investors interested to fund you the rest of the way. So. Anyone else? Uh, I have a question myself. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll just a question myself. I'm very interested, Brad, in the uh, the end effectors, the sort of stuff you've been able to access through uh, the sort of 3D printing. I can get the concept of using the magnetic torque to propel mm -hmm. the device. What's your thinking on how to actually operate the end effectors? Well, um, so what we, 
what we've done with some of these, uh, uh, for instance, this is a paper that just should be coming out here on, on this device. Um, so this is a kind of an Archimedes screw here uh, where uh, part of it is magnetized and part of it isn't. And so as we move this, we, we, if, if we move in one direction, it moves easier than the other direction. So if we, if we, if we rotate the field in one, in one way, it'll come out and, and we'll draw things in. If we move it in the other way, it'll push, it push them in the other direction, but we can also twist it and get it to swim. So it's, it's a little, uh, it's a bit of a trick uh, in this okay. case. Um, but what we've done is we've only magnetized portions of the device, okay. and, and so then, and, and we, we also have, uh, there's just a, a big design space here, so you can also have resonating structures and, and resonate fields, and it's kind of, it's fun from an engineering yeah. standpoint yeah. to Great. figure out how to do that. So. Okay, there was another question here. Hi, just a couple of quick questions. Um, once these things are in your body, how do you get them out? Um, or do you get them out? And the other question was, it's not my field of expertise, but I seem to remember reading that there's been sort of new success in terms of manipulating things on the atom size with ultrasound. And is that something you'd be interested in moving into? Yeah, yeah. Two good, very good questions. How do you get them out? Two, two in the eye, we have a little tool, and we can just drive them, and, and, it's a little, and we bring it right, like a syringe with a little magnetic. So we, we can take them out if they're one device. But we just have a paper. Uh, it's accepted. The galley proofs just went in last week um, on on devices that are biodegradable, and so you leave them and they just dissolve over over time in the body. And um, so that's uh, again one of those little blocks you kind of take over. Okay, we've shown that. Uh, now what's the next thing we want to show? Uh, in terms of uh, ultrasound, yeah, we actually we're starting to look at ultrasound. I have a, a person uh, uh, looking at that. That's that's and that's what's interesting is a lot of people have shown things, but. It, a lot of times, the, the first people who do this are, are, are the, the material scientists or the chemical engineers who can make them. And then they show they, so, but they, they don't get into the, the mechanics and the physics. It's out of their field. And, and, and I think that's, uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. I think it's fascinating because uh, it, it's complicated. And uh, uh, now we, as we understand it, now we can design better, better systems that way. OK. Well, Brad, your enthusiasm for that field is uh, quite palpable. Thank you very much for a terrific okay. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Right, that leads me to uh, hand over to Peter Bruce to close the event. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dick, for chairing that last session. Uh, it's late in the day, it's Friday, so I'll keep this really very, very brief. Uh, first of all, I would say, wow, what a wonderful set of talks we've had today. I think it's been extremely stimulating. I found them fascinating and uh, We've heard from some real experts in the field with some real insight, and that's been extremely valuable. I, I think I said at the beginning of the day, um, we wanted to think about where the barriers are to uh, progress in this field, where we need fundamental breakthroughs, how we can strengthen industry, and how we can strengthen the science industry interface, and what we can do about skills in this area. And I think that's been addressed by a number of the speakers We've captured all those comments and the comments from the floor, and that will be written up into a short report. Uh, so I think that's been extremely valuable. Uh, I won't go through all the points that I think are valuable. There are many of them. I just wanted to highlight three things, a rather personal take on the whole process that, that really struck me. Uh, the first one is that although clearly robotics has come a long way, and we have robotics in manufacturing, Robots operating in unpredictable systems, I think what Nick addressed, is still a significant challenge and there's still some, some considerable way to go in addressing that. And of course, unpredictable environments are essentially what most of, most of the real world is. And so that's still a considerable challenge. And I was very struck by, by Catherine's talk. Um, it, it, it sort of highlighted for me that I, I guess conventionally a lot of robotic systems have used perhaps only one sensory input, vision in some fa fashion. And of course, as humans, we, we sense our environment um, with multi-sensory inputs in ways we don't often think about. Uh, and I'm sure that's an important area for the development of, of robotics in the future. And then the third point, I guess, well, the other point I was going to say is that, that I think it was actually David that mentioned it, the issue of assets. And that's, I think, important for translation. Having environments that things can be tested at the high TRL levels um, that really ensures there's a continuous pipeline uh, to, to, uh, to, to industrial products. And I'm sure that's something that we'll take away and think about in terms of the, the UK context. And then the final one was really going back to the, the talk we heard right at the beginning from Bernard Charles. The, the, 
the issue of systems and the importance of systems in addressing the challenges in robotics. Um, and perhaps that's an area where, again, uh, the conventional training of science and engineers has not really met expectations in terms of trained personnel who can really deal with multidisciplinary systems approaches, and that's perhaps something, again, that we need to think more about in the future. So that's my personal take on it. Um, I just want finally to thank the Royal Society staff uh, who have done a great deal of work preparing things for today in advance. They've done an excellent job. I'm sure you'll agree that, that this has been a, a well-organized and uh, an exciting and enjoyable uh, meeting. Um, I simply then want to, ask, to wish you um, a safe journey home. Thank you all for coming. And uh, that's it, I think.